actually my intent um, today, and I, I should have a disclaimer up front, when uh, Karen introduced me as a certified association executive, I am not a supply chain management practitioner. Um, to, to, to speak to credibility, I think you don't have to work in supply chain to head up an association in supply chain, and my expertise is in association management. But that said, I've spent about the last eight months traveling across Canada and meeting with over 100 employers in all areas of supply chain management. So I certainly will be able to bring some of that information in um, as, you, uh, as you have questions at the end. But I had really wanted to focus, and I don't need to tell you too much more about PMAC, but on some statistics that we have about supply chain management and uh, so the gender divide in supply chain management, how that compares to um, Canada as a whole. Um, looking at some of the opportunities, particularly that, the, that some of the recent human resources studies are highlighting in, in terms of the opportunities in supply chain management, and um, sort of exploring what we can do next and, and seeing whether we've got some action takeaways. So you've heard the, the history by and large of, of PMAC. I think the one thing that I do want to focus on is we function as a federation. So I'm the head of the National Association, which is based in Toronto. But we do have the network of provincial and territorial institutes across the country. And actually at the far table, um, I've got uh, Cindy and Lena, who are here from the Alberta Institute, and they're going to be here for the, the whole of the conference. You can see the SCMP booth at the end. So if there's any further information that you want about PMAC, I won't go into very much more of it now. But I did want to at least highlight with the SCMP designation that Kara was talking about, we do currently have um, over 3,100 individuals who hold the designation across the country. That includes those who were grandfathered from the CPP. And 43% of those are women. So I think that's actually an excellent st uh, statistic. And um, it actually aligns very well with the male-female split in the association in general. We're about 46% um, female, so that's also strong in terms of our, our membership numbers. But in terms of uh, being able to bring you some statistics, uh, PMAC partners each year with um, the key publications, the key trade publications in supply chain management. So purchasing B2B, materials management and distribution, and uh, Canadian transportation and logistics magazines. And we've been running a survey for a number of years, which we now call the annual survey of the Canadian supply chain professional. In 2012, we had over 2,400 responses to the survey, 36% of which were women. And we do have some trending, at least right back as far as 2008, so we're going to be able to see how some of the trends and statistics um, are progressing in the sector. So one of the primary things that we look at when we run the, uh, run the survey each year is wages. Um, I think in general, we like to know uh, where wages stand for the field of practice. But we were specifically able to go back and drill down in terms of what the wage gap looks like between men and women in the industry. And currently, that gap sits at just over $16,000, or about 17.7%. So a pretty significant gap. And it's a gap that hasn't changed since 2008. Salaries have progressed, and you will see that the progression is there um, for both men and women. But that's, it's, the gap was 17.2% in, uh, in 2008. So salaries have grown on both sides, but they've grown on the men's side by 11.2% and only 10.6% for women. So hence the, the gap stays about the same. And that gap gets wider the longer women stay in the workplace. So just when you're starting out, the, the wages are almost equal. And then we see where the split starts to come in after 15 years in the industry, and it gets even wider after 25 years or so in the industry. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the causality later on and sort of look at perhaps some of the, the explanations and thoughts behind this. But certainly one of the factors that came out when we started to look at how the salaries correlated to positions in, in the industry, and when survey respondents said sort of this is the level of my occupation in the field of practice, you can see the male-female correlation where we've got a much higher hit for the men in the managerial and the executive sectors, and the converse, we have a much higher hit for women 
on the clinical and administrative. So obviously when we start looking at um, salary averages, that type of differential is going to come into play. We, we also had sort of more, a more subtle link because there's a question that we, that we ask on the survey because we're wanting to know that this concept that has been spoken about a number of times today about supply chain management becoming more, stri more strategic is where do the people who are responding to the survey, how do they feel that they stand in terms of influence at the executive level within their organization, at the C-suite? And again, we see um, a significant difference in terms of who has influence, with that being more men than women. But I was even more concerned by the statistic about the number of women who said they don't feel they need it, far higher than the men. And I think if any of us are going to be taken seriously as professionals, we want to be, we want to be needing that influence. So that was an interesting correlation for me as I went through digging down into our data a little bit further. What we're also able to see as well is within the salary differential, there is an influence based on the, the industry sector. And it's going, and I know again you're looking at sort of fine print here, but it's going from the highest areas, and I can't say that this was a significant surprise for me. Um, transportation was one of the highest gaps, so Kara, we're going to have to work on the railways, obviously. Um, going down from there to the wholesale trade, construction, because I knew I was coming to Alberta, oil and gas, it's interesting to see that the oil and gas figure is pretty much on a par with our overall average. It's just a little bit um, under 20%. But it's also not surprising that at the far end of the scale is where we see educational services, public sector, um, health care and social services, and those are the areas where you, you do have sort of legislation uh, around parity. But even there, we've still got a gap. It, it's certainly not uh, completely aligned. So then we thought it would be interesting to look, that's just where we stand in supply chain management. So what do we look like Canada as a whole in terms of the gender gap? And now supply chain management isn't looking so bad because the overall gap in Canada is 29.2% across all sectors. And this came out of a report that was in the Globe and Mail in 2010, so it's pretty, pretty recent statistical information. And if you look at that, that sidebar box, I was amazed to find out they have an annual, um, there is an annual conference on um, wage parity. And Canada's ranking was 20th behind Sri Lanka, Lesotho and Latvia. I think that's not something for us to be very proud of as a country. Um, so, but interesting to see, I was interested to see those higher ratings in the, in the developing world. And to see that, you know, perhaps where you have people doing leapfrog into a newer economy, that there's a little bit more of that parity there. So let's talk about some of the causes of, uh, of this, th this disparity. And here I'm speaking in both generalities, but items that I think that also probably apply in, uh, in supply chain management in particular. Um, one item that is cited is that level of education is a consideration, and it is actually becoming something that is bringing the wages closer together. The gap is generally narrower the higher, level, uh, the, higher the level of a woman's education. However, it was interesting, in the 2010 study, the Globe and Mail actually found a little bit of a reversal there, and Alberta is perhaps one of the biggest culprits because what's happening is there are now so many men who don't necessarily have a high level of education who are earning fantastic wages um, in the oil fields, and that's actually starting to skew the gap back again, unfortunately. One of the gaps that's, that's commonly cited is the fact that women have children. And it's not just the period of time that we spend out of the workforce on maternity leaves and those sorts of things, but it quite often moves forward into the kinds of career decisions that we make because we are typically the ones who make the sacrifices for the balance for family. And whether it's making choices for um, positions that don't require us to travel because we need to be at home to look after family, whether it's because we don't take the positions that require us to work 10 and 12 hour days because we need to be home for the family. These are, these are realities and again, I think some of that is starting to shift and there's a recognition that 
men are equally capable as long as we remind them of picking up the kids. Um, sorry to the men in the audience, I know that's a very, uh, <laughs> a very bad generalization. But, uh, but those are some gender stereotypes, and they are there, and um, I, I do think we continue to battle them, and I think we continue to make progress, but they, they are a realistic factor. I did mention that industry sector is a factor. Just as much as it was for supply chain management, it is right across the Canadian economy, and the same kinds of of divides that I, that I looked at. So some of the areas where the wages tend to be closer are in those public sector um, areas, social sciences, um, arts, culture. Um, so some of them are sect sectors that are female dominant, and then others are, are areas where the parity has been a little bit more legislated. But across all sectors, and I, I think this is a disturbing statistic, is that women consistently earn far less in management positions and also in sales and service roles, which was an interesting comparative factor. And the one other item that I'm going to cite, because I think it plays on, on points that both, uh, both Kara and Bobby made, is they, they do cite a tendency simply for that concept of women's personalities not being about putting themselves forward um, for those opportunities, whether it's the, the lack of confidence, whether it's that we do want to be at that 100% before we're um, before we're ready to go, but um, once again, there's a feeling that that, that, that factor plays, uh, plays into things. But we are at a period of time, I think, within supply chain management that um, presents a number of opportunities, and now's the time to be thinking about how we capitalize on them. And much of the information that I'm going to present here does come from research that was done by the Canadian Supply Chain Sector Council. That was one of the groups that uh, CARE identified. And actually, no, tomorrow morning, you're going to be hearing from Kevin Maynard. So I think we're just going to continue the practice of stealing each other's thunder. So I will tell you lots of information, and that will take away from what he has to present tomorrow morning, potentially. But um, the, the Supply Chain Sector Council, which does receive funding from the federal government, um, has just renewed their labor market research. So they do an HR study every five years that does a projection five years into the future in terms of where the, the field of practice looks. The current um, statistic is that there are 767,000 positions in supply chain. Now, the, the Supply Chain Sector Council really goes very wide and very deep in terms of the, the occupations that they count, and that will be everything from the forklift drivers up to the chief procurement officer. So it's very broad. But a significant part of the, the Canadian workforce, and 39% of that workforce is female. You can see where the, the split is by sectors, and these are the sectors that um, the Supply Chain Sector Council has used to, to divide up the industry. So you do see huge numbers in warehousing, and that's where you will see a lot of those positions in picking and packing and and forklift operation. But we do see the senior management roles. We do see you know, significant area in inventory management, in purchasing and procurement and sourcing. So it, it is quite diverse. And some of their key findings when they went through, and I don't think this is different from, from any sector because this is the, the direction that Canada is going in in general. But we currently face a shortage of skilled employees, and it's only going to get worse. Um, the alarm was sounded on this about five years ago um, because we had the pending baby boomers that were going to be retiring. A again, it's a huge demographic fact of life anywhere in the developed world. But the recession of 2008 put a lot of those retirements off because people's nest eggs suddenly dropped dramatically and they were going to have to stay in the workforce slightly longer. But all it did was delay it. It has not made it go away, and we are still going to be having to deal with it over the next few years. And the big change that that makes is because of the age of the individuals who are le leaving the workforce, it's the senior management tranche that is going to be leaving. And that represents a significant challenge for businesses right across the country because there's a significant knowledge component within that group of individuals. But as far as I'm concerned, it's a huge opportunity for women to start to change that differential in terms of the management uh, positions that are available. And I think somebody mentioned earlier sort of the, the glass ceiling. And we saw the numbers in terms of how many managers are, are male, but many of those will be in that baby boomer 
um, gap. And I'm hoping that will represent an opportunity for, for women to bring those numbers closer together. And the talent pool is quite small. Um, the, the numbers, I think if I got it on the next slide, I do. The, the numbers that the uh, that Supply Chain Sector Council is estimating that are, we're going to have vacancies in the next five years is 66,000 positions every year for the next five years that are going to have to be filled. Lots of people considering moving, but the, the scarier statistic for me than that was when those numbers were posed to the companies who responded to the survey the next round and said, you know, how are you as a company dealing with those skill gaps? Over a third of the companies that responded said they were going to steal them from other companies. <laughs> I'm a little bit worried about the sustainability of that, uh, of that strategy. And certainly for us at PMAC, we think that's a very good opportunity because it means there's going to need to be a focus on skills development and training to move people into those roles because they aren't going to be available organically. And we face a significant challenge in that in supply chain because it's not a very visible profession. Uh, Kara just told us how new it is even in terms of being recognized as a professional. But just to do a quick poll in the room, how many of you in, in high school said, when I grow up, I want to work in supply chain? Okay. <laughs> All right. Somebody needs to interview that person because that's the first one I've found any time I've asked that question in a presentation. Oh, she's still in high school? Okay. Oh, excellent. <laughs> okay. Cindy, we've got one convert. I want you to talk to her. But it, it's, it's an emerging and evolving field of practice, and it's also, it, it's largely invisible. It's a behind-the-scenes um, type of occupation. So we are very pleased to start to see its growth in the post-secondary community and as businesses start to recognize its importance it is going to become more visible but it makes current recruitment that much more of a challenge because you're even trying to, to have people understand exactly what the field of practice is about. Um, this just gives a little bit, and, and again, I know we're looking at fine print, but the projections are that those 66,000 positions that need, that need to be filled, 12.4% of them are going to be in managerial in, in, at a senior management level. Career pathing is another very important um, piece of the puzzle, and there was a little bit of discussion about that this morning. And this has been one of the reasons why we either lose people with potential or have trouble attracting them because we don't do a very good job as a field of practice in being able to define and excite people about the career paths and the career opportunities that they have available. And I think particularly for women, this could be a big part of the puzzle. The Supply Chain Sector Council, <laughs> there's Kevin, speak of the devil, <laughs> who's just come in. Um, the Supply Chain Sector Council has actually done um, some excellent work on drafting some of those sample career paths so that students and individuals who are considering opportunities could see the various directions that, um, that the field of practice can lead them. I'm sure many of you have experienced it yourselves because you've sort of fallen into these roles as they've become available. But we need to be more proactive about identifying a destination and particularly if we want to bring our female peers along, is identifying those and helping them get either the skills, the knowledge, or the experience they need to, uh, to aspire to those positions and to give them that confidence if that's one of the barriers. Some of the skills needed in the next five years that, uh, that the Sector Council has highlighted. Um, computer skills still rate very high. The, the concept of technology, we heard about ERP systems. A big part of our designation focuses on knowledge management. The big thing I'm hearing right now is everybody jumped on the ERP bandwagon. But does anybody know whether the systems are really working the way they need them to within organizations? Or, or are we still at a garbage in, garbage out um, type of stage with, uh, with, those, with those systems? And I also think in many cases, those systems are Cadillacs, but we don't know yet how to use them at that Cadillac level. So they're not providing uh, the information that they could be. Project management is a huge part of what we do in the field. Negotiation skills, customer relation skills. When I see some of those, that really tells me how transferable, really, 
some skills into our sector are. And this is an opportunity, again, to go back to what was said earlier, let's not worry about having 100% of the skills because we do have a lot of these transferable skills that we can bring into those roles. Um, supply chain management in particular in some of that research came forward as being attractive, um, being attractive to a number of people, and these are the types of messages we need to use from a recruitment perspective. But in particular for women, it is seen as being a field that does allow for some flexibility, some, some work-life balance. Um, bigger organizations are investing heavily in it and creating opportunities where there is some job security, there are the benefits, there, there are the ability. Um, the more we become tech savvy, the more there is the ability, whether it's working from home, working remotely, that's available. But the range of opportunities because it, it remains an evolving sector, really continues to be one of the, the attractions and something for us to highlight when we're looking to, uh, looking to recruit anybody into roles, but in particular moving women forward in the field. So in, in terms of concluding my, um, my specific remarks, because I was asked uh, again to leave a fair bit of time for discussion at the end, so what can we specifically be doing in supply chain management? Certainly on PMAC side, we're going to continue to highlight those survey results. And, and it was interesting. I was actually challenged by a member. You know, well, why are you putting those numbers out there? We don't want people to know that. And to me, yes, we do. Because if people don't know those numbers are out there, the actions aren't going to happen to make them change. And I think, I think we need to equip the women in supply chain with the documentation that those gaps are there and to start asking why when we do have um, equivalent competencies to, uh, to bring to the table. Next year, we've talked about in our survey, because I, I have talked about some of the causalities earlier today, and I'm, interesting, I'm interested to hear if during the discussion period anybody has anything to add to, to those causality factors. Um, but we're actually going to survey the industry, both men and women, and ask them specifically why they think that gap exists in supply chain management and see if we get a little bit more intelligence about that that, that will equip us to, uh, to address the disparity. Encouraging the use of the salary calculator. Part of um, the benefit that purchasing B2B provides with this partnership that we have on, on this survey, they actually take that data and they plug it into a salary calculator on their magazine's website, and there's also a link to it from PMAC's website. I think there's a link from the Supply Chain Sector Council's website as well. But you can plug in your position and your region, and it will give you the data on what the average salary is for that position. So if there are any women who are needing a little bit of a bargaining chip, um, it's certainly a place to start uh, with respect to some of the research that's available out there. Um, encouraging women to pursue their designation or any other professional development. And I think this is where the women who are currently in, um, in managerial positions have the opportunity to provide that mentoring. Um, obviously, I, I have a bias towards the SCMP designation, and I'm willing to admit that. But there are a number of ways, and we are, we are growing, actually, in terms of the educational opportunities that are available in this profession. And I know when somebody asked about ways to build credibility, I think some of those credentials are the way to do that. And as well, they're, they're sort of building on the confidence side. And the, the mentorship just takes that one step further. And I think really the, the whole Engage project is, is turning this into a day and a half of mentoring because you're hearing from some great leaders um, within the sector. But I think um, our next step is to figure out how to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And within PMAC, even as a general response to our, um, our member survey, we will be looking at developing sort of a, a structured mentorship program in the near future. And um, I, I don't think there needs to be a gender bias in a mentorship program. But it's certainly um, a way for us to encourage women to, uh, to pursue different opportunities. And then right here in the, in the Calgary area, so I might as well bring it very close to home, um, the Alberta Institute does offer a number of opportunities for networking, and I think that's the other way for, for women to be able to, to get ahead is to, is to um, move their way into the, uh, 
the old boy network, to, uh, to coin a phrase, and start to find out um, you know, who are the players in the industry, where are their opportunities. Going to some of the regular dinner and breakfast meetings or the professional development events is the way to, uh, to make those connections. And not just connections about positions, but connections about expertise. It gives you access to a network of individuals who may be dealing with some of the same challenges that you are. If you're able to tap them for the solutions, you become the hero in your organization for bringing that, um, that solution forward. And that's certainly a way to be noticed and to be promoted.